We come in our studies in Revelation to the great climax of the battle between the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God. This is the point where, using Daniel's words, where the stone cut without hands smites the image upon the feet and break them in pieces. And when the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold were broken to pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away. No place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And we, brethren and sisters, we live in the time of those tow kings. And we remember that in the, day of the, the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other, to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. And the governments of this world, brethren and sisters, whether they be run by suave and sophisticated diplomats or by crackpot dictators, they're about to be overthrown. And their great cities, their mighty militaries, their technology, their infrastructure, their pomp and their vain philosophies will soon be ground to powder and carried away by the wind. And so if we come to our chapter, to Revelation chapter 19, and if we come to verse 1 of our chapter, we read there, And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at our hand. And brethren and sisters, God is praised here. God is glorified for his righteous judgment on that great hall. And you know, there's no room for humanistic philosophies in our faith. There's no room for them in this judgment, which put man humanistic philosophies which put man and his welfare and his rights first. You know, God is going to judge the world in a way that the modern world would call genocide. He's going to commit a, what they would call a crime against humanity. That's what God is going to do, brethren and sisters. And we have to be clear in our minds that the very concept of human rights is utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. Of course, the Bible teaches that his people should love justice and mercy and goodness. God demands that we love our neighbour as ourselves. But for humans... To assert their rights. It's utterly ridiculous. You know, we see the ants, don't we? And we tread on them. What if the ants were to rise up and assert their inherent dignity? What if the rats were de to declare their inal inalienable right to life? And liberty and the pursuit of happiness? What would we think? I know they can't speak, but imagine they could. We'd think how ridiculous. 
and humans have no more rights than the rats or the ants. God has, God is our creator, brethren and sisters. We feel it, oh, that it's our right to, to kill animals because we want roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. We have no rights, brethren and sisters, before our God, do we? And when our creator eradicates the scourge of man's arrogance, his puffed up human philosophy, and his corruption, then the faithful will rejoice that the earth can finally become a place of righteousness and of peace. For this whore that we have here in, in verse 2 has stood against God and his servants all down through the centuries. And perhaps we find it difficult in our day and age to see the, the papacy as such a big deal. Well, it's not a really a powerful force in the modern world, is it? But it's like the shepherds that we read of in Ezekiel 34. I'll just put the slide up. Seemeth it a small thing unto you that ye have eaten up the good pasture, but ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your, of your pastures, and to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet. And as for my flock, they that eat, they that which ye have trodden with your, sorry, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore thus saith the Lord Yahweh unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Or perhaps as Jesus puts it, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And you know the church, brethren and sisters, has not only blasphemed God, but they have prevented those entering in. They have muddied the water, as we might say, with, as with the cattle. They have despised and corrupted his words. They've used God's name to gain power and make money. And they've brought God and his word into such disrepute and the gospel into such contempt in our day and age that it's nearly impossible for anyone to come along with the Bible and say, look at the Bible. People won't hear, will they? And the churches have brought it into contempt so that people won't even give it a hearing. Verse 3 of our chapter, Revelation 19, verse 3. And they, and again, or the second time they said, Alleluia, praise to Yahweh. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. This destruction of the whore will be forever, brethren and sisters, won't it? You might say, well, the smoke won't literally be forever, but... The destruction certainly will be. It's as in Jude where we read, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And we will rejoice, brethren and sisters, when that system is swept out of the way. We will praise God when that system is gone and the truth can be preached. Verse 4, we read, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And we naturally ask, well, who are the twenty-four elders? And who are 
the four living ones as it should be. Well, you may have heard me say this before, and you might well hear me say it again unless you uh, take evasive action so you don't have to listen to me standing here again. But I think when we come to chapters such as this, we're asking the wrong question. The question isn't so much who. Why not? Well, if we look at, um, at this chapter, there's a, a lot of different characters, if you like, in the chapter. Um, we've got a great voice of much people in heaven. We've already read it in, in verse 1. And we might ask, we might even put it up, we might ask, well, who is that? And what are they doing? We might ask who the four and twenty elders are and who are the four beasts or four living ones? The voice out of the throne. Well, well who's that? Um, the voice of a great multitude. The voice of many waters. The voice of mighty thunderings. Who do these symbolise, brethren and sisters, we might ask? The, the um, lamb and his wife. The angel that's speaking to John. The... Um, white horse and the him that sat thereon and his armies in heaven which follow him and finally um, the angel standing in the sun and even the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven we might be saying well well who are all who do all these symbols represent and the answer must be christ and the saints simple as that we've answered the question if we said right well they all represent Christ and the saints. And we can tell you what they're going to do. They're going to destroy the whore. They're going to destroy the kingdom of men. And they're going to um, establish God's glorious kingdom. Well, there you go. We've answered the question. We've dealt with the whole chapter. Because all the symbols represent Christ and the saints. And what they're going to do. And that might seem somewhat unsatisfying. You know, well, why have we got so many symbols all representing Christ and the saints? All, all representing the same thing, we might think. But it's the same if you think of various other things in the Bible. For example, the tabernacle is a good example. Too many examples, but never mind. Um, you might say, well, who is the brazen altar in the tabernacle? Well, the altar's obviously Christ. Well, okay, well, who's the lamb that's being offered as a burnt offering on the brazen altar? Well, that's Christ as well. And who's the altar of incense that, through which the prayers ascend to God? Well, that's Christ too. And, well, who's the mercy seat? And you can go on. Who are these symbols? You have all these symbols in, in, in the tabernacle and you just keep answering with the same answer, what they represent. And it might seem um, very unsatisfactory. And the reason is we're asking the wrong questions. We ought rather to be asking what aspect, what aspect of God's plan and purpose, of God's character, of God's um, plan is being symbolised by these different symbols. We might answer in that case, well, um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm no, no. Um, I'm speculating very briefly. You know, the the brazen altar is the means by which um, the acceptable offering might be offered up you know and the provision of the spotless lamb willingly as a, a lamb done before her shearers pouring out his life is seen in in that lamb the means by which prayer can be acceptably offered um, being the altar of incense and different aspects of the work of christ are being shown it's not about different people it's different aspects of of God's glory that's being shown. And again, I'm not going to be definitive on what all of these symbols um, might give us. But I will 
perhaps give some um, and speculate on some others. Maybe you can um, give me a better answer in some cases. The great voice of much people in heaven. Let's try that. Well, if you look at verse 1 again. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Well, they're in, this voice is in heaven. It symbolizes, being in heaven, it symbolizes the fact that it's in power. It's in government. But this government is a government that is telling the people to give glory and honour unto the Lord our God. It's a government of the world which is going to teach the people to serve their God. And when we come to the four um, and twenty elders, um, read verse four. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fall down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Well, who are the twenty-four elders? I will suggest it's the priestly aspect of Christ and the saints. We find in 1 Chronicles chapter 24 that the sons of Aaron are divided into twenty-four divisions. Um, to do the work of the priest throughout um, the year. 24 divisions. And what about the four living ones? Well, I suggest the military and civil authority of God's kingdom. Why do we say that? Well, we not only find four living ones here, we find four living ones if we come back to Ezekiel, of course. If you turn there with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding upon itself, and the brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof was the colour of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living ones, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Well, what I would suggest there, first of all, is these symbols of the fire, the brightness, um, and the whirlwind. We're seeing the execution of God's judgment in these four living ones. The pouring out of punishments. And if we read verse 7, and their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of, a car, of calf's feet. And they spikle, sparkled like the colour of burnished brass. And their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. And they went everyone straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. And so we see the straightness. Whatever God, wherever God wants them to go, they go straight there. You know what we're like, aren't, don't you, brethren and sisters? We're told to go there and we wander all over the place, don't we? And we don't get round to doing what we should do. The cherubim go straight there. <coughs> it's manifesting their righteousness. It's manifesting their obedience. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not. When they went. And if we look in um, the Gospel of John um, and chapter 5, verse 26, we read, For as the Father hath given life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And you see in those chapter, in, in that chapter, many things said of the, of the Son, because he's the Son of God. But when it comes to the fact that he has authority to execute judgment, it's because he is the Son of Man. Because he's overcome. Because he's been obedient and done what's right. 
Therefore, it's been given to him to execute judgment. And it's the same with these living ones. They have straight feet. What God said, where God said to go, they went there. And they turned not to the left or to the right. And consequently, judgment has been given to be executed by them. And we see in those symbols as well, we notice the colour of burnished brass at the end of verse 7. You know, it's flesh that has been through the fire, has been polished um, because it's sought to serve um, God. And so because they have overcome, it is just and right that they should judge those who have given themselves to the flesh. Here's the, again with the sim- similar principle. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he will rule over them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. To him that overcometh, it's right that that person should be the judge. Why are there four living ones? We might immediately associate with four um, the number of metals in Daniel chapter 2, in Nebuchadnezzar's image. The four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. The four horns of Zechariah chapter 1. The four forms of a caterpillar. You know, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar that we read of. Um, Four forms of locust that we read of in Joel chapter 1. And God sets this number four there before us as the military might and civil authority of the kingdom of men, which bruised and broke in pieces and subdued their contemporaries. But God has also set, if you like, four on four. He has set against the kingdom of men's civil and military authority, the kingdom of God's civil and military authority. And here we have the four living ones. We've already seen in... um, We've already seen the the four living ones in Ezekiel as well. But we have four carpenters which are set against the four horns in Zechariah chapter 1, don't we? You know, there's four on both sides. There's four, there's a military and a civil authority for the kingdom of men. There's also a civil and military authority for um, the kingdom of God. Four chariots in Zechariah chapter 6. Four standards in the camp of Israel, I'm sure you can probably think of some more. Um, four symbolizes um, those things. And the next character that we see, if you like, in, in it, going back to Revelation 19, is the voice out of the throne. What is symbolized by the no- voice out of the throne? In Revelation 19, verse 5, um, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Well, turn back with me, would you, to Revelation 3, verse 21. Here we have in the epistle to the Laodiceans, the letter to the Laodiceans, in the last verse there, verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. To him that overcometh will sit down with me in my throne. And here in um, Revelation 19, verse 5, a voice comes out of the throne. And I'd suggest that what we see of the voice in the throne is those who are overcomers. They have overcome, they've endured. 
unto the end. And they call to their fellows, praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. By their example, they call to us, brethren and sisters, they call to us that we too might endure unto the end. And then we see these other voices, the voice of a great multitude, a voice of many waters. Well, I'm sure many of us immediately think of what some of these symbols um, can be about. Um, Revelation 7 verse 9 says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. Here we have the voice of a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And it's in God's plan that in Abraham all the families of the earth will be blessed in him. And all of these people from all the different nations can be adopted into the family of Abraham, can be grafted into the Israelite olive tree. And Revelation 17 verse 15 says, The waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The voice of many waters. It's not just the Jews that are going to form the population of the kingdom. It is God's purpose that all of these nations can be adopted into that family and can be there. And so we come to the lamb and his wife in verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Be glad and rejoice, brethren and sisters. We can be there. And those of us who are there will indeed rejoice. You know, if we're there, we'll suddenly see with a clarity that we've never had before the marvel of how we, who are just flesh, who are weak, foolish creatures, have been accounted ready, have been accounted righteous. And there we are, bride, in beauty, arrayed in white, the righteousness of saints. And indeed, we will be glad and we will rejoice. And we will cry out, give honour to him. Give honour to him. Because we haven't saved ourselves. It's not our righteousness. It's his righteousness. His glory. His goodness. His mercy. That has brought us to stand there at that day. Give honour to him. And verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now I might be completely wrong here. But I suspect that that f phrase that we have there, These are the true sayings of God, means more than simply saying, that what's gone before in the, in the verse, in the passage, is correct. These are the true sayings of God. Is, so the previous verse is really God speaking. Well, the whole Bible is God speaking, isn't it? The word for sayings is probably, as you may well guess, logos. These are the true words of God. And what is the word of God, brethren and sisters? Well, we have it here. 
in paper and ink. We know when we look at John, the Gospel of John, chapter, sorry, chapter 1, verse 14, we see how Christ was the Word of God made flesh, manifest in the flesh. And now, not now today, but now at this time here, in this vision, his saints will be the true word of God also. These are the true words of God. We haven't quite finished with the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll come back to it very shortly. But let's push on. Verse um, 10. John says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You'd have to read it all the way through, but the angel that we have here, sorry, the the, the, the one speaking to John that we have here um, is the angel from the previous chapter. <coughs> is it a heavenly angel? Is that who says that? Is he of... Um, is he John's fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus? Of course, in Revelation 22, if we turn over a couple of pages, verse 9, sorry, yes, we'll read verse 8 for context. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets. And of them which keep the word of this book. Worship God. How is an angel John's fellow servant? How does he keep the testimony of of Jesus? How is he of thy brethren, the prophets? Um, Certainly... Certainly, I think that yet again we see a symbol that represents, in fact, this messenger is Christ and the saints. It might be perhaps a little hard to swallow that you have Christ and the saints symbolized in this messenger, this angel, um, that is talking to John, who is obviously one of those faithful brethren. One of those prophets. Nonetheless, that is what we find in this kind of picture um, in numerous times. Um, And I believe that um, that is how we should understand it. And so we come to verse 11, where we read of the one on the white horse. Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And in verse 14 we find, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We might think that having come now down to this one on a white horse with his army, um, clothed in white, which is righteousness, and they're going to go forth to judge in that righteousness, you might think that, well, we've left the marriage supper of the Lamb far behind, that there's sort of not much connection between this one on the white horse and his armies and the Lamb and his bride. But I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think, in fact, that there's one theme running through the chapter from the beginning of it to the end. It is the celebration of a victory 
uh, over and the destruction of the whore. This is a marriage supper with a difference, brethren and sisters. You know, it's not a wedding with posh food on decorated tables where the nations um, watch the saints make their vows to Christ. You know, if we imagine that when, God willing, we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's going to be like an extra special fraternal tea. Um, I think we're wrong. I don't think that that's what we're talking about. Let's carry on, and um, I'll try and explain as I go along. So, Revelation 19 and verse 17. <clears throat> and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. So, the angel that's standing in the sun, he's crying with a loud voice, To the fowls of heaven. The fowls that fly in the midst of heaven. These birds aren't in the trees, brethren and sisters. They're not on the ground. They're in heaven. And I believe that the fact that God tells us here that these fowls are in the midst of heaven is the fact that they symbolize the saints in authority in that age to come. And the angel cries, come and gather yourselves to the supper of the great God. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. We might think, oh, this is just calling to the literal birds to come and eat all these dead bodies. I don't think it is, brethren and sisters. This is a call to the saints to come and destroy and rejoice over the destruction of the kingdom of men. You see, they're invited to a supper, a great supper, it says. We had a supper earlier, didn't we? The marriage supper. It's the same thing, I believe, brethren and sisters. In, in essence, we're talking about the same events. We're looking at them from a different angle, but we're talking about the same events. And we noticed back at verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. This is not a fraternal tea, brethren and sisters. Little sandwiches with the crust cut off are not on the menu. Instead, as we read, um, as we've already read, they're going to destroy. They're going to eat the flesh of kings. And it's very much the theme going through here. It's the righteousness of saints, it said in verse 8. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. In verse 14, that those that follow him are upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean, so that they can pour, they can execute judgment upon the kingdom of men. And verse 19 continues, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is the supper that we're talking about in this chapter this is the judgment executed by those who are clothed in righteousness and brethren and sisters there's no room in our faith for humanism for the thinking of this world the nations are mad with it they laugh at the astronomers of old who thought The sun and the stars all went round the earth. 
They laugh at them, don't they? And yet in their philosophy, they've made themselves the center of all things. Everything revolves about man and his wants and his rights and his dignity. And I really believe that when Christ comes, even if they come to understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and that there is a God, a creator, even if they come to understand that, that many will start, still not see why they should bow down to him because of their human rights and their dignity and their inalienable right to life and so on. The nations are mad, brethren and sisters, and ultimately God has no choice but to break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. For many will not submit. They will, many will not obey. And the only way that this earth can ever be a righteous and peaceful place is by the destruction of those that will not accept the Lord Jesus Christ in that day. And so we say, all glory be to him, brethren and sisters. Let us press towards that mark. Let us push out the thinking of the flesh and the arrogance and the pride of man's philosophies. And let us be that bride who hath made herself ready, that in that day we may be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come.